looking at those three program representations, you could say you see control flow and variables. So control flow tells us about behavior. It says what happens next, what happens in which order, what should I repeat, or when should I do what. And variables are about state. So control flow will be behavior, variables will be state. So I want to point out first the different control flow constructs we have in all those three levels of our program or those three representations. In our source code, we see a for loop here. So that means do something multiple times. That's kind of the most interesting control flow construct here. In our Java byte code, we don't see this for loop, at least not immediately. But we have different kinds of instructions here. And some of those instructions actually have to do with control flow. One of them is this here. If ICMP GT. Another one, you could probably guess if you go down here, given the name, is go to. So those two instructions actually are implementing our for loop. They have to do with the jumping around that this for loop requires. If you go to the machine code, Intel machine code, you see also similar instructions. So this one not, this one not, but here you have a jump less or equals and here you have a jump greater or equals. So you also have two branch instructions here. When you look at the for loop it has some conditions. For example here is a condition if i less than or equals to n. And somehow there is also a condition in here. Actually, that condition is here. CMP. Okay, compare. Greater than. So it's not exactly one-to-one -one translation. If int comparison greater than, then do something. And you see something similar here. You have actually two comparisons here. You have test and you have compare. You have comparisons in here and you have branches in here. And now what you also have is targets. You need to say, well, where do I jump to? And the targets are given with the operands here. So here you have 19 and here you have 4. So those two numbers tell you where to jump. So the numbers in the Java bytecode, they actually refer to bytecode indices. So when we say go to 4, it means go to this iLoad instruction at bytecode index 4 and continue execution there. If we say if ICMPGT 19, it means jump to this iLoad instruction if the condition is true. Okay. Here in the machine code, we have similar ideas. We also have this branch, and then we have somehow the target of the branch, but this time the target is given as a label. Here is a label, and here is another label, L20 and L21. So this means that jump less or equal to L20, and we'll go here. And here it says jump greater or equal to L21, and we'll go here. Okay, so you see that you can jump around pretty much arbitrarily. You can just jump to some address, you can jump up and jump down, and you can create an infinite loop if you want. You can create all kinds of strange constructs. It's very spaghetti code-like, it's very unstructured. But over here in the source code, you have a nicely structured control structure, a four. It can't just jump around wildly, it's always going to go back up and then does the test and it jumps out when it's done with the loop. There's one more control flow construct, namely the return statement. So here we say we're done with this method. That translates to I return here, meaning return a value of type int. And if you look here, return sum and sum is a value of type int. And this translates to ret here. So we return from this function. Now let's look at not control flow, but variables. If we go to our source code, we have several variables. You can probably spot them. 
how many do you see? So I already pointed to one. You have n, which is declared here. It's really a parameter, a formal parameter of this method. Then you have sum, which is introduced here. It's a local variable. And you have int, which is introduced here, which is also a local variable introduced in this loop. Okay? n, sum, and i. Over here, you don't see any n, sum, or i, but you see numbers. And some of those numbers actually are numbers of variables. So variables in bytecode, they are not named, but they're numbered. And some bytecode instructions store something in a variable or load something from a variable, namely store or load instructions. I store stores in an int. There's another I store which stores in variable number two. Then we have two I load instructions. Here one. Here is loading from variable number zero. Then we have another I load instructions from variable number one. An I load from variable number two. And we store something in variable number one. And now we have something interesting. I inc is not exactly a risk instruction, not exactly a reduced instruction set instruction. It's kind of a complex instruction. It does a lot of things. It loads a value from a variable, it adds a given constant to that value, and then it stores the result again in the same variable. And which variable do we talk about? Variable number two. And what's the constant we're going to increment variable number two by? One. So the last instruction that has to do with variables, and you see there's a lot of them, is I load. Okay, I load one. If you go and look at variables or data in the machine code, then we basically see registers here. So instead of load and store, we basically have move instructions in Intel. So we have a register here called EAX and over here we have two times mentioned register EBX. So those registers have names. Here we move constant 0 into a register, constant 1 into a register. Here we add a value from a register to a register. Then we add a constant to a register. This looks like incrementing. Then we compare to the value of two registers. And that's basically it for this, this block of code. So you see here we have names of local variables. And here we have numbers because it's not really read by a, a human. And here we have registers which are also names. But they really correspond to physical registers. Physical registers in the CPU. Now I'd like to do this mapping from the sum variable to some number here to some register here. It's not always possible to do this mapping one to one, but in this case, this simple example, it actually is. So we can create a table and we can have the name, then we can have the number, and finally you can have the register representing the same thing. So let's write down the names. We have n, which is our formal argument for the method of type int. Then we have sum, which is the variable in which we accumulate some sum. And then we have i, which we use to loop through our, through our loop. Then over here, we can try to guess which local variable number corresponds to which variable. What do you think? So if you look at it, what you're doing here, somehow you're 
putting a zero, the constant zero on the stack and then here you're storing this in local variable one. Okay, you're storing the value zero in local variable one. So local variable one is sum. Okay, so we know sum is local variable one. Then here we have iconst one and we store that in local variable two. Okay, you see here we have one and we store that in i. Okay, local variable two is i. And then we have one local variable left. We see we access it here, i load zero. We never store anything in that local variable. And if you look over here in the source code, which variable do you see that we only read or load from n, right? Because it's passed in as an argument to this method and we don't actually change it. We just use it here when we compare. Okay, so n is number zero. And now the registers, we can do the same trick. We know that we move value zero into eax, value zero into eax, um, value 0 into 1, so this is EAX. And then we have somewhere where we move value 1 into EDX, value 1 into EDX. And finally we have EAX, EBX, AD. D, A, D, B, D. So B, X is the last one. Okay, see the registers are named according to the Intel way and you basically have register A, register B, register C, which we don't use here, and register D. So that's it for the two different aspects of program representations. One is control flow and the second one is storage of data, in this case storage of temporary data.